Uh, my name's Jo, for the people that know me, but Joanne Dickens. I am a midwife by background, more recently bereavement specialist midwife at University Hospitals of Leicester NHS Trust, which has been missed off the, uh, the gumph. Um, and also, I've just recently started my PhD at the University of Leicester. And this talk is sort of based around my initial um, investigations, literature review, um, looking into um, what I'm going to be looking at eventually, which is around the perinatal mortality review tool. So that's a bit about me. Um, I'm guessing we're all midwives in the room. How many of you are regularly involved in clinical governance or perinatal mortality in your trust? So just very few of you. Okay, yeah, absolutely. And who's already heard of the perinatal mortality review tool or the PMRT? A few more of you, that's good. So for the rest of you, I'm hopefully you'll learn a bit more by the end of this session. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about the case for parental voices in perinatal mortality review. We're going to be looking a bit about the background to this issue and the current climate in this country. We're going to be looking a little bit about why and how we should do reviews when a baby has died. What some of the challenges are to actually involving bereaved parents in the review of their own baby's death. And what are the, local, what are the opportunities and potential solutions to some of these challenges. And then I'm going to conclude a bit. And if we've got time after that, we can have some questions and discussion. Is that OK? Yeah? Good. So a bit of background. Nearly six in every 1,000 babies born in the UK are either stillborn or die shortly after birth. So as we all know already, but here's some of the evidence behind that, this has absolutely profound effects and enduring effects on the parents that it affects. That, um, are the parents of the, ch of the babies that have died. And this extends to all sorts of areas of their life, to their confidence, their ability to relate to others, their ability to go back to work sometimes. It's, it, it's really a knock-on effects with economics. So understanding why their baby died actually figures really highly in some of these parents. And that is, that is again, borne out by some of the um, evidence uh, with Redshaw and colleagues um, listening to parents' report in 2014, parents said that understanding why their babies died was a really important element of, of the process of care after their baby died. So looking at the current climate, some of you might know a lot of this already, but you may be already be aware there's a government ambition to halve the stillbirth and neonatal death rates by 2025. That was in the Safer Maternity Care report um, by the Department of Health. Um, and there's lots of initiatives that you might also be aware of that is all around safety and, and, and fortunately, you know, some of these things are really, really starting to have a good effect. The Embrace Confidential Inquiries, the Embrace Surveillance Reports, we've got the Saving Babies Live Care Bundle with a second iteration recently, um, we've got the Grow and the Gap Programme, so there's lots of things, and the Each Baby Counts Reporting Programme, so there's lots of things that are all coming together at the moment to help drive change and help bring these, um, these rates of death down. As part of the Safe for Maternity Care, um, the Department of Health also said that they were going to start um, using the Healthcare Safety Investigation Branch to do external reviews um, of all uh, neonatal deaths and term stillbirths. Um, and also another thing that's going on that's quite topical at the moment, I don't know whether any of you have seen that um, there's been a consultation paper being produced recently. There's a consultation now until the mid-June mid about whether terms, so stillbirths after 37 weeks, should be subject to coronial investigation. So you know that when a baby dies after the baby's born neonatal death, then it's often referred to the coroner. If the coroner chooses to proceed with an investigation, then it will be a coroner's case. So what this consultation paper is looking at, whether that should, help, should happen for term stillbirths as well. So I'd really encourage you to get involved with that if you're interested in that, because the consultation's happening at the moment. On the one hand, it's going to bring potentially greater equity. Obviously, it's just a, when a baby dies, parents, it's, you know, the baby dies just before birth or just after birth to a parent they've lost a baby. So bringing great, greater equity between stillbirths, unexplained stillbirths, and neonatal deaths is potentially a good thing. But what we also have to understand is that some parents wouldn't choose to have a post-mortem for their baby. And if the baby's subject to coronial investigation, then a post-mortem would be taking place. So there's, there's sides to the argument, isn't there? So what happens when a baby dies? Green top guidelines, guidelines RCOG guidance, um, 
guides what, what kind of clinical investigations should take place. We should be offering post-mortems. We should be offering that the placenta sent for histo histological examination. We should be doing certain bloods on mum, certain swabs, cytogenetic studies. But what those guidelines also say, which we don't always think about too much, is that um, this should be put together, together with a multidisciplinary and standardised re review. And this is to learn from the review, to improve outcomes, quality of care, or to highlight good practice, actually. And then what happens next is that the, those outcomes, the outcomes from the clinical investigations, plus the multidisciplinary review, which is, I think, what we haven't done very well in the past, putting the two things together, is then fed back to the parents at a consultant appointment. So if the baby's been stillborn, then that would normally be the consultant obstetrician that either looked after them in the pregnancy or looked after the baby at birth. If it's a neonatal death, the gold standard is it should be a joint appointment between the consultant obstetrician and the consultant neonatologist, and that doesn't always happen nationally at all. It, we're getting better in Leicester about that. We're getting quite good at that at the moment. And that you need, you need them both there because you need the whole, you know, the whole that antenatal care, the intrapartum care, the postnatal care, and the neonatal care all together. And you need to be able to plan for future pregnancies for these families if they're ready to talk about that then. However, there has been some recent research by Siasikos and, and colleague, not this reference here, it's actually a 2018. He was actually involved in the RCOG guidance as well, so I've confused you slightly. Um, but he's done st some study recently um, looking at there's that, that period of time when the parents have gone home after the death of their baby up until the consultant appointment. Often that's the time, and I know this from experience, and probably you know, know as um, community midwives going out, they really feel that that's the time parents feel like that the information drops off, that the support drops off, and there's this kind of gap between going home and actually being seen by the consultant. So potentially involving parents in the review of their baby's death maybe might meet some of this gap as well. So why do we review deaths? Obviously, there's a safety and outcomes element of this. It's, it's undertaking a standardised and multidisciplinary review for all still, stillbirths and neonatal deaths should be considered necessary against the background of improving patient safety and outcomes. And over the past few, two decades, um, you'll all be aware of sort of national inquiries such as the Morecambe Bay investigation into failings of care, they have highlighted the need for learning from errors and for patient involvement in planning care, provision and patient safety. A further source for this, and we've heard a bit about the Better Births today, is the National Maternity Review and the Better Births Report. And that found that when things go wrong in maternity care, the processes for review can vary different, between different care providers. And they called for a national standardised process for reviewing in, in order to improve organisational learning and future outcomes. And this has also been underlined by the Care Quality Commission report in 2016, saying that there's a need for standardised um, framework to improve learning around problems that contribute towards a death. So it's not surprising, really, when we're looking at things like confidential inquiries and the Each Baby Counts report, and knowing from being involved with some of the Embrace confidential inquiries that I've seen such a vast range of what different hospitals do from a one-sided pro forma that a single reviewer has just filled in a few boxes to a 30-page root cause analysis document. You know, how can parents, how can that be balanced in the review of different ba babies' deaths? So this was what was found um, in the uh, confidential inquiries and the, RCA and the um, Each Baby Counts reports. So I'm looking at the PMRT really because that's what I'm looking at at the moment and this is um, on why the PMRT has been um, developed really. The Perinatal Mortality Retool, Tool, Review Tool or PMRT was a clear response to the need for this standardised systematic multidisciplinary and high quality per perinatal mortality review. And the reason it came about was um, the Healthcare Quality Improvement Partnership, who are a national consortium who aim to improve the quality of care through audit, clinical audit, appointed a, collabor a collaboration led by Embrace UK. And you can see from the um, slide, those are all the people that are involved in this collaboration, to develop a web-based standardised perinatal mortality, re mortality review tool. So this is... It's based on, on the internet, it's web-based, 
and you have to enter and it follows the entire pathway. So hospitals cannot choose to just review part of the care. What you sometimes see in some of the reviews done nationally is they may be just focused on the intrapartum bit and they missed out the fact that there was antenatal issues that were missed or antenatal good practice that was missed or vice versa or they focused on maybe um, the neonatal care when actually there was an intrapartum issue that had been. So it, it's looking at every part of the care pathway and you have to complete all of it and it has bits of guidance embedded within it so if you're not sure as a reviewer what you're looking at or what the guidelines for managing GDM in pregnancy for example there's a drop down box that shows you what the national guidance is. The PMRT project built on the work that was done by the Department of Health and SANS which is a still birth and neonatal death charity. Their perinatal mortality task and, and finish group recommended that all babies who were born, uh, stillborn, or died after 22 weeks gestation was subject to a thorough and systematic review. And um, after an initial quite short pilot phase, the PMRT was implemented nationally in early 2018. And as you can see from the bottom quote, the PMRT places specific emphasis on parental engagement in the review of their baby's stillbirth or neonatal death. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the PMRT process, um, this is the flowchart that is on the PMRT website that we should be following. And as you can see, it's supposed to fit into the local governance sort of SI um, processes anyway. Um, but the, it's supposed to, you know, it's, there's supposed to be equity in that all babies will get reviewed even if they don't meet the criteria for SI. And you can see um, that quite quickly within the process under the exploring issues, the first circle, it's, it, you're looking to gather um, feedback from the parents that, to tell them that a review is being taken place and to gather some feedback and any of their questions or concerns at that stage to feed into the actual review itself. Then there's a process whereby the information, the clinical information is entered onto the PMRT tool and then there's a discussion, a multidisciplinary discussion that's had to kind of finalise that. And then the end point, there should be a report generated which should be then um, shared with the parents but translated into a meaningful plain English summary for the parents to have and that should be fed back to them at the consultant review. So this, the, the importance of this and the improvement of safety and outcomes implied by the standardisation and the use of the perinatal mortality review tool has been underscored by the requirement of trusts in England, Wales and Scotland to meet the targets relating to the use of the PMRT as part of the clinical negligence scheme for trusts, in maternity incentive scheme. So you can see from the safety action one in the CNST incentive scheme that there are targets around just using the tool itself, but there's also a target saying that 95% of all parents should have been told about the review of their baby and should have been asked whether they got any questions according to the review. So with this being mandated through the CNST, there's a potential that this could place pressure on trusts to do this without really thinking through what they need to do it with and what resources, what the resource implications are, or even how to do it very well. I mean, what are the barriers to engaging with bereaved parents regarding the review of the death of their baby? That at the moment have been looked at, in some cases, there, there's been some, some, some research around it, but I think there's, there might be some more that we need to look at and to explore. Firstly, and obviously, a stillbirth or neonatal death is primarily the tragedy for the parents of that baby. But what we've got to remember is it's not devoid of effects on the healthcare professionals that look after the parents and look after the baby them themselves. So the exposure to traumatic perinatal events is associated with PTSD in midwives. And also barriers to effect giving effective care following a stillbirth. And also the effects on, we don't hear much about cons consultant obstetricians sometimes, but actually the effects on consultant obstetricians after a stillbirth, they can find that particularly difficult to manage can affect them on a personal level, influencing their future care provision and leaving them feeling weighed down by a sense of professional responsibility and fear of potential litigation. So some of the evidence around parental engagement and healthcare professionals' um, in, um, attitudes to that was the Parents 2 study. And um, Parents 2 study was a qualitative focused interview group study 
and it had clinical professionals, but it also had um, stakeholder participants. And they felt it was really important to involve parents in the review of their baby. They also mentioned that they felt that it was important that the midwife involved in the actual care was involved in the review. And the, the, the rationale for that was they felt the midwife would be able to bring an additional asset, sort of information that the doctor wasn't necessarily privy to, that the midwives would know a bit more about potentially what was going on. Another thing to kind of consider is the thought, there's the notion that actually being involved with a, a review like a root cause analysis as a midwife might help us emotionally process what's actually went wrong. But given what we've said about the PTSD and the effects that can be had on healthcare professionals, it's easy to kind of imagine that this might produce barriers for us to actually engage with parents over the review. And we need, we need some more research into exploring this. Also, the other thing that I always think about is the fact that I think about three or four people put their hands up to say that they were regularly involved in review or regularly involved in clinical governance or knew about the PMRT. So where do we get the skills? It's a different skill set. as We are midwives, aren't we? It's a different skill set to walk into a, um, into a meeting and to present um, information. So where, where, do we get the, where do we get the skills for that and the training for that? Another challenge might be the fact that it is something that's going to be mandated now. So with the CNST uh, requirements, is there a possible danger that parents' voices in review could turn into a bit of a tick box exercise that trusts us to have to review? There's lots of literature around sort of um, targets. In, um, Bevan and Hood's detailed commentary in 2006 looked at how the theory of governance by targets has been undermined by the fact that by improving measurable targets, healthcare providers essentially then demonstrate reductions in the parameters in areas that weren't captured by the targets. So maybe you're doing this bit right, but actually not doing the bits that we should be doing right, if that makes sense. A good example was when they decided that all GPs, should, all GPs appointments should be within 48 hours. Some GPs just meant they didn't take any bookings over 48 hours. So that wasn't really what it was meant to be about. Um, so there's a potential that that could happen in this circumstance as well. In the Parents 1 fo um, study focus group, which was before the Parents 2 study, that had 11 brief parents and they felt that they would really want to know about their, the review of their baby's death. But the reality might be that local resources aren't in place at the moment, including the time allocated to actually communicating with parents sensitively. There's n completely different provision nationally for bereavement midwives, for example. And I'm not necessarily that saying that bereavement midwives are definitely the best place to be the link between the review, but essentially that's probably what's going to happen, that bereavement midwives will take upon that role. But there are some trusts that don't have a bereavement midwife, or they have a bereavement midwife that's a clinical midwife that's assigned a day a week or something like that. So, again, we need to look, think about that more carefully. Clearly, bereaved parents are the number one priority, and they have the greatest stake in understanding why their baby died and how the care was given. Whether care was really good, which it might be, they might want a feedback that was really good, and that would be, you know, great or there are areas for improvement, either that contributed towards the baby's death or separate from the baby's death, but might be a missed opportunity in the future to improve outcomes for other families. The Health and Social Care Act of 2001 states that it's a statutory duty of all NHS organisations that patients are involved in and consulted about their care. But how does that actually relate to the retrospective review of care and consultation with parents who are grieving after their baby has died? Those of you, and it's probably most of you in the room, who have cared for bereaved parents will already know that approaching them in the midst of their very, very raw grief and disbelief, the tragic circumstances they now find themselves in, is extremely difficult and requires empathetic and sensitive communication skills. I always worry, so I'm sure you worry as well, about the potential for causing more emotional harm or the potential for the unintended consequences of trying to do good, where we perhaps give the wrong information or mixed messages about what's meant to happen next. And how do we deliver that information sensitively to parents that are maybe not able to engage at that stage? So I think that's another area to be um, looked into a bit more. And also parents are individuals, aren't they? We know as well that what 
mum needs or what part needs at any given time is different to each other sometimes. So that's another area. I think it's particularly pertinent um, sometimes to parents with complex social factors. There is an association with complex social factors that there's non-engagement anyway, so how do we reach out to those parents? And how do we capture the views of hard to reach groups of the parents? So we've done, obviously there's some research around what parents would want in that Parents One study and other studies potentially, but how do we capture the views of the parents that we wouldn't even engage with you at that stage, or potentially wouldn't even want to engage with you ever about the review of their baby's care? The other thing that I think might be a challenge is where parents' views, and we've had this before, I've seen this before in the past, not particularly for the PMRT, um, but if you know, you're know you involved in risk, um, how, when the parents' views of the events surrounding the death differ from what the, what's in the clinical notes, the contemporaneous, documentation and understanding how we reconcile the events between what parents think you know and believe happened with what healthcare professionals think and believed happened is also another area that could benefit from further exploration so what's some opportunity at the moment so there is there are there is work around how we can improve engagement and how and things to help us in the recent months, there's been a subgroup of the PMRT collaboration, and they've met regularly to develop resources that will assist trusts with seeking the views of parents and their contribution to perinatal mortality review. And I've just put the link up to the PMRT. They're not on the PMRT just yet, but that will be the link for looking at them when they appear in the next, hopefully, few weeks. This subgroup has included healthcare professionals and lay stakeholders, including a bereaved parent, um, and the guidance has been developed using those parent studies plus um, the being open principles um, of care that NHS Lothian have been piloting recently. It will be, as I say, available on the website very soon and there will be standardised resources that people, there are templates that people can print off, there will be a flow chart that you can put up on labour ward or put up you know, in the coffee areas or whatever that shows you what the flow chart should follow. There will be um, template letters to send to bereaved parents, um, plain English summary um, examples of good examples and bad examples. Um, and these obviously will probably be quite welcome to teams that are trying to think, well, how do we do this well? How do we engage with parents well in a sensitive and appropriate way? But obviously these resources are only tools still. You know, if we use them well, then they'll be good but if we don't use them very well then they won't be they'll only be as good as the paper that they're printed off on and we need some more um, thought locally around the capacity and time and resources that will be involved with actually sensitively approaching parents so in presenting the evidence for the case for parents parents voices in, in perinatal mortality review today I've also outlined some of the challenges to meaningful, appropriate, appropriate and sensitive engagement with bereaved parents. We, as midwives and healthcare professionals, need to be aware of all the circumstances where parents might be asked to be contributing towards the review of their baby's death. So whether that's the PMRT, whether that's the HSIB investigations, whether it's the, there's an SI going on, or whether it's the coronial investigation of their baby's death, which presents the challenges that we've talked about in terms of um, whether, they've, whether they wanted to have a post-mortem or not. But what is overwhelmingly clear, bereaved parents are the number one priority in this situation and have the greatest stake in understanding why their baby died and how care was given. You might, you might have noticed that I had this picture, this fuzzy picture on every slide. Um, it's fuzzy now because it's how do we keep the focus on bereaved parents. Because I really believe that they're the centre of this and focusing on them is what's important when we think about engaging with them regarding review. So how do we overcome some of the barriers discussed today? Such as the impact on healthcare professionals involved in review, the potential for limited capacity within the trust that we work and resources, and how do we deliver meaningful engagement, sensitively approaching hard to reach or very, very distressed and grieving parents? I haven't got the answers to all of this yet, by the way. And how do we engage, engage with parents to the best of our ability? I think these questions are the basis for our ongoing discussion and will be what I'm taking forward with my PhD over the next three years. Thank you.
Yes. Has anybody got any questions for me? And we should have a roving mic. Actually, she's got two mics. That's like pretty mic. impressive. <laughs> oh, no, we've got two people with <laughs> Any questions? Oh, you're all being very nice to me. Oh. oh. <laughs> Hi there, my name is Sue, I'm from um, Warwick Hospital. I just had a question about the difference between the review using the PMRT yeah. and the findings of the NEHSIB <laughs> investigations, yeah. and yeah. is that going to be confusing to the parents? I, yeah, I think there's potential. Um, it could be potentially confusing to the parents. What HSIB, I believe, are saying is that the, they, the two things, trust should be using using the PMRT as well. So if an HSIB investigation is taking place, the PMRT investigation review should also take place at the same time. And HSIB would almost act as, because the other thing that I haven't mentioned today, because it's outside of the scope of what I was talking about, was that the PMRT, you're supposed to have an external reviewer as well on your PMRT review. So the HSIB would work as sort of your external review and the two things should be, you know, put together. And HSIB have said that they are planning you know, they're, they're developing their service around meaningful engagement with parents, um, that they should be involved with the review and revolve, involve and get the report when it, when it comes. So I think it's going to be sort of a, we work this out as it, it goes along and it might, yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? We have two mics free for any questions that you might have. You're obviously desperate for a cup of tea. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Joe. That was great. Okay.